What is up, people? What is up? A little love from Like I Am by Ritz. Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode two of The Word. A little sales jolt with me. I'm Keenan, and my lovely, smart, and keep my ass in order, Ruth P. Penders. What's up, girl? How are you guys doing? Glad to be here. Episode two. How to do a kick-ass sales demo. Bet you don't know. You're going to know before you know. It's going to be tight. I'm excited. Um, it's going to be a great one. So, guys, a couple things to kick this off. Ruth, we want people talking. It's a freestyle event, don't we? Absolutely. So we're going to get the um, comments, questions, a uh, little contest going on our sales jolt, has hashtag sales jolt on Twitter. Um, who wants ASG gear? Look at this. Look yeah, at this. Look at that. Ruth right. Sportniks. For the ASG gear, um, the person with the most tweets plus retweets throughout the show at hashtag sales uh, will get that gear. So we'll the uh, right. comments, tweets, quotes, um, whatever. Let's get them rolling. Let it begin, let it begin, let it begin. Good stuff. Um, all right, so today's topic, as Ruth said, got to have my Red Bull. Love you, Red Bull. Today's topic is how to do a killer demo. And what's important about this is most salespeople don't do a killer demo. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to kick off here in just a second with a legendary demo, video of a legendary demo. Some of you may have seen it, some of you may not, but it is legendary nonetheless. Um, we have Mark Roberge, who I'm super, super excited to have on the show to talk about his new book, but also how HubSpot do does demos and why his formula for doing demos works, so you want to pay attention. I'm going to share a story about the worst experience happened to our company in the buying process around demos. So let's just kick it off and make things happen. So first and foremost, there you go. The craziest, most legendary demo ever. What I'm trying to say is that uh, our new brake pads are really cool. You're not even going to believe it. Like, um, let's say you're driving along the road with your family, and you're driving along, la la la, woo, and then all of a sudden there's a truck tire in the middle of the road, and you hit the brakes. <laughs> Whoa, that was close. <laughs> now let's see what happens when you're driving with the other guy's brake pads. You're driving along, you're driving along, and all of a sudden the kids are yelling from the back seat, I gotta go to the bathroom, Daddy! Not now, damn it! Truck tire! Eh, I can't stop! Oh, help! There's a cliff! Oh, and your family's screaming, Oh my God, we're burning alive! No, I can't feel my legs! Come to me, dragon! Wee -wee -wee. And the medic gets out and says, oh, my God. New guy's in the corner, you get his guts out. <laughs> All because you want to save a couple extra pennies. <laughs> and to me, it doesn't get out. Now. <laughs> Do you validate? No. <laughs> uh, I freaking love that. I absolutely love that. I mean, look, demos crash and burn like that all the time. And here's the funny part. I've sat on some SaaS demos that are worse or better than that, depending on how you want to define that. That's the best part. I think that's a trip. Ruth, what do you think about that? Well, besides the hilariousness of uh, Chris Farley there, legendary, um, you know, what stuck with me was uh, just because you want to save a couple pennies. Right, it brings it back to you. Mm -hmm. It's funny, when you think about demos, that was pretty, from the demo piece, it was kind of bad. But I loved his summation. His summation was brilliant. And he nailed it all so you could save a few pennies. He's got a burning car on his desk. It was, <laughs> it was friggin' awesome. So how many of you do demos that bad? Or the flip side, that good? Because... That's better than some of the demos I've been on. And I actually want to lead into our story with that. Demos, look, in the SaaS world, people, 
demos are extremely important in the sales process. And I'm not going to talk about when to start the demo and all that stuff. I just want to talk about the demo itself. But SaaS is growing. Cloud computing. So more and more of the applications we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day are in the cloud. And so customers are going to want to see them work. They're going to want to see you do something with it. So this is important, important stuff. And I want to tell you about our personal sales process. This is the most fucked up sales process I've ever been part of, ever, as a salesperson, as a sales leader, or as a buyer. In this case, I was the buyer. Ruth was part of this. Ruth, how bad was this? <laughs> um, it was legendary. Ah! <laughs> yes, except we didn't have Chris. Yeah. Not in a good way. Not in a good way. Yes, and we didn't have Chris. That's the part about it. We didn't have Chris to help us, but... So I'll, I'll make it short. Guys, we needed a SaaS product here. And to respect the company, I'm not going to use their name, although I'm so desperate to, to help them fix it, but I'm not going to. So we had a system here that was our recruiters were using, had a sales guy recruiting, and it was working. It wasn't perfect. But we were small. We were in our first year. It was working for them, but it wasn't working for me. As the owner of the company, I had no insight into the business, and this particular platform we were using had no reporting. So I was like, okay, I need reporting. So I went out and I looked at a bunch of different alternatives and we had this one company come on. I called them and they're a leader in the space. And I won't even talk about the fact that I, I tweeted, hey company, I'd love to work with you, but I signed up for a demo and it's been two weeks and nobody's called me. That's the first mistake they made. Nobody called me. So I had to tweet and complain about the fact that no one called and they got back to me right away. So we set up a discovery call. Good shit, right? They ask me what's important. I tell them exactly what's important. Ruth is on the phone. Ruth is there with me. Our lead recruit is on the phone. So I got three people from my company on the phone, and we basically tell them the things that are most important, which is primarily, Ruth, which was primarily what? Reporting. Reporting. And we also told them why, didn't we? Yeah, so you can um, have a good look into the business and how we were progressing. And uh, yeah, as your position, yes. you needed that. Yes, so told them how it was important it was. So fast forward to the demo. We're sitting at the demo, and this is in July of last year, people. We're sitting in the demo, and after an hour, an hour, they still have not said one stinking word about their reporting capabilities and how you do them. They said nothing. So finally, I chime in and say, yo, where's the reporting? I've been waiting for this the whole time. And he said, well, I was going to show those at the end. Are you fucking kidding me? You spent 60 minutes, 60 man hour minutes for me, my assistant, and my lead recruiter to do a discovery to find out what was important to us, and then you just default to the first thing you know, and that is the standard boring, look at this feature, look at this feature, look at this feature. I was irate. Ruth, I mean, I was... Was I, I was pissed. Yeah, it was, it was a waste of time. And frankly, um, most uh, websites have videos where we can just, on our own time, take a look at the features, right? So why not bring yeah. that to the customer? Tailor it to us. So this cat and this company wasted four man hours of our time. So I was so ticked. I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm not buying this. I know I can't deal with this. So, of course, the pain started growing with the product we were using. So we called them back. And, Ruth, you, you talked to them. You called them back. Tell us what you did. Yeah, I was the one to uh, set up the second rep. Well, so I called them back and um, straight up was like, hey, our previous rep just was not working with us very well, was not listening. We need a new one. Is that okay? And this is what happened. Let's avoid it. So what happened? <laughs> So they set up another discovery call. I'm like, well, it's a bit much, but, you know, maybe they want to get it right this time. Maybe she doesn't want to rely on the other salesperson. So I'm like, great, discovery call. We tell them what we read. We tell them what's important, which is? Reports. Thank you. We go to the next demo, and sure as shit, people, I know you know how the story ends. This time I'm less patient. I wait 45 minutes for them to get to it, and they don't, and I have to stop them and say, where are are the reports and they still made the same mistake again blows my mind I fuming so I know for a fact this happens all the time so why does this happen this happens because first you salespeople you don't listen to the customer 
Two, it happens because sales leaders do not set up an infrastructure and a framework that allows the salespeople to deviate from a scripted demo to a responsive demo that is focused on the salesperson, I mean focused on the, the end user. So guys, here is what you need for a killer demo. We want to talk more about this with Mark shortly, but I want to make sure everybody understands this and we lay this out. First, the demo is not, and let me repeat, not about showing your product. It's not about your product. The demo is about helping your client understand how your product or service can fix their problems, solve their challenges, and improve their future state. It's not to show them every feature. I promise you that. Number two, if every single demo needs a discovery call, and I'm, I'm applauding the market because I'm seeing more and more discovery calls, but if you don't take these discovery calls and actually use them, and you create a tailored, customized demo, you're wasting everybody's time. Everybody's time, and no one needs their time wasted. So let me give you a hint on how you know if you're doing a good demo or a bad demo. So folks, take a note here, right? You want to hear this. If in, if, in your demo, you use the word if before you show a feature, you're doing it wrong. So if you say, oh, if you look to do this, let me show you this. If you're looking to accomplish this, let me show you this feature. If you guys are organized this way, you'll like this. If, and the feature, if you're doing that, you are doing it so wrong, I don't even know where to start. Because every time you say if, you might as well change that and say, I don't know what your business is, but I'm going to show you this feature. <laughs> I'm not sure how you operate, but I'm going to show you this feature. I don't know very much about you, so but I'm going to show you this feature. Because that's what you say every time you say if. If. So with that said, the goal of your demo should be a, to set a vision of your customer or prospect about what their world is going to look different with your product or service in place and it's a chance for them to almost try it on. It's like a dressing room as you attack each and every one of their individual needs through the demo. It's that simple. Ruth, had, had that company done that to us, we would have been into a product a lot sooner, huh? Oh, plenty simple. We wanted plenty to soon. buy our product, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they made it hard for us. Th their sales prevention department happened to sit in sales this time instead of another group. Yep, yep, yep. So with that framework laid out for you people, with that said, it's a good transition to introduce our guest this week, the man, Mark Roberge, the author of the Sales Acceleration Formula. I started reading it last night and I couldn't put it down. It's a fantastic book. It is fast-paced, he nails it, he marries art with the science, you know, he tries to pretend he's not doing that, he's doing it, he's doing it well, I don't, I'm don't. i giving him shit because he's an MIT guy, I don't think an MIT guy could sell, but he's nailed it, so let me introduce, without further ado, my man Mark, what's up baby? Hey Keen, how are you, great to be here, loving the show so far. Hey Mark, good to have you. Hey, how are you Ruth? Good, good. Good. I'm, I'm jealous. I need this nice little background like you guys got going on. You should have shipped me out some board or something like that. This is pretty sweet. <laughs> Dude, you got, the, you, got the, you got the scruff going. I shaved this morning. Maybe I should. No, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I'm trying out this new haircut. I don't know. I'm all in this like, transition time, man. I'm, I'm seeing how it all goes. We're doing a lot of experimenting over here personally. But dude, look, you have hair to experiment with. I'm not <laughs> in the wrong direction. You know what I'm saying, baby? <laughs> nice. Uh, you can't tell when you're wearing a ski helmet, right? Hey, man, I don't wear a helmet. Oh, okay, <laughs> nice. Well, <laughs> there you go. You know, you know what? Do you play blackjack? You play blackjack? Oh, yeah. Heck, yeah. I, I actually did a little event with the, uh, the team from the 21 crew there that they made the movie about. Uh, the founding guy actually did a little event with last year and met him. It's pretty cool. That is cool. So you know what they say when the, the um, dealer turns over an ace and they ask you if you buy insurance, right? You know what the, the rule yep. is to whether or not you buy insurance? What's the rule? Insurance is a tough one. That's uh, if It depends what the... Uh, I don't know. You got me on that one, man. 
Never insure a losing hand. Okay. Right? So if you have a losing hand, never insure. That's why I don't wear a helmet. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. That's great. That's great. (laughs) So, so Mark, thank you very much. Yes, we have books. We have books. Yes, thank you, Ruth. Tell us. We're going to give some of these away. How do we give them away? Help them out, Ruth. All right. So we're giving away two books. And um, thanks, Mark. Courtesy, Mark. Cool. And um, the person, the first two people that can tweet at uh, hashtag sales Joel, um, what is it? One of the four elements that go into the sales acceleration formula. Hashtag sales Joel. Good one. All right. Ready, set, go. So, Mark, let's kick it off, my man. Yeah. Um, you, I'll let you choose where you want to go. Do you want to start with my rant on... Uh, yeah. Demos, or do you want us to talk a little bit about your book and, and where? No, no, no. Let's, right let's talk about demos. People showed up for demos. Demos is awesome. Your rant was awesome. It was amazing. Like I almost don't have anything to say because my rant's the exact same as yours. I mean, we we, we spoke yesterday. It's it's always comforting when you got two guys who've been in the front line for a while, not with each other, and you come out with the same conclusion. You're like, oh, you even feel more confident that this is the right way to go. But you know, so I've scaled the team over to a couple hundred people. We've been through lots of demos in the last eight years, and I, I hear you exactly. It's almost like I frame it as three different levels of maturity for a rep, and I'm amazed. I have my same horrible war stories in, in, in being pitched as a VP of sales on different types of products, whether they're commission software, and everybody does the first level problem, which I call show up and throw up. I'm amazed at like, how many people, they're in sales for decades, and they think that selling is show up and throw up. It's like how many people decades. are on the phone, decades, there, and they're like, my goal in sales is to get to as many people on the phone so I can tell them my story. Oh my gosh, right? So that's level one, and we try to get people away from that. Then level two is, okay, we get them sold in on the power of a discovery call, but they sort of do a discovery call to check the box. They're just like, yeah, my boss told me I need to do a discovery call. So I'll ask them, like, in our context, it's like, do you need more leads? <laughs> and, you know, I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll, be, I'll get on the phone, and, like, I'll get, you know, one of my reps will be like, hey, Mark, would you mind jumping on a demo with me? And I would say, yeah, sure, let's, let's talk about what, what the results of the discovery call were. So what's their main uh, problem? And it's like, well, they need more leads. Like, that's it? That's all we got? I mean, that's everybody in the world. Like, do we know how many? Do we know how they came up with that number? Do we know um, how they intend to do it? Do they know if they think it'll work? How do they get the challenges? How do they get them today? How many are they getting? Exactly. It's just these are all the things we got to go yes. through. So, so that's the the second problem is they they understand they have to do discovery, but they're just not doing it well. Then the third level, which you know, it's good when you get there, but then it amazes me how many people get stuck here. Is they do a beautiful discovery. It's just like. Hey Keenan, so you know why'd you download the ebook? Great, you need more leads. Great, you're hiring more salespeople. Great, you need 20% higher. Great, you want to do it through generating more content and landing pages. And it's like so basically, Keenan, if I can show you a way to increase your lead flow by 20% in the next three months by generating content, then that'd be worth a thousand dollars a month to you. Yes. And we haven't even done a demo yet. We haven't even done a demo yet, and we're close. <laughs> Trial close. Beautiful. Yes. Yes. Then we turn over the demo. And it's autopilot again. It's like it's like we didn't even have the conversation. You nailed the discovery, and the demo is like exactly what you said. It's like not even connected. So, and that's that's a challenge. Is now we have to like not do the same demo every day. And and so you know that was my notes from from uh, this week and in preparing for today. And it's amazing that like we're kind of on the same wavelength from from different avenues. And it's just comforting that that's the way it's got to be. Mark, can you do anything? Oh. Yeah. And lower your mic just a little bit. The sound is too okay. loud. Okay. I don't know how to lower it. But oh, you can't? Yeah, let me, actually, I might be able to figure that out. Hold on. Yeah. Keenan, go on your rant. Let me see if I can figure this out. Yeah. So do you think that salespeople put themselves in the shoes of the buyer and ask themselves, what would it be like to sit and watch somebody show you features or functions of something that you don't need and you don't use? Yeah, say, so say it one more time. Sorry, I'm trying to play with this configuration. Don't worry about it. It's not that bad. Okay. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kenny. No, right, so, so I said, do you ever think salespeople stop and put themselves in the shoes of the buyer and think to themselves, what would it be like sitting in a demo watching someone show me things I don't need and I don't use? Yeah. Yeah, you're, that's a good point. You know, maybe that's a good way of, of doing it in training because I don't think they think that way. You know, honestly, I think I think this is all rooted from – 
when you hear the word demo, this is what you think. You demonstrate the product. And they're, they're a bit thrown off by that. And I also think, like, they kind of want a job where you can sort of just, some of them, like, want to just get through the day. And it's just so much easier just to be like, yeah, I did my job. I showed up. I did the five demos that I was supposed to do, and it was easy because I told the same story. Asking tough questions, doing great discovery, it's hard. And then You're taking fake. that discovery, yeah, and then and then really manipulating the demo to like be the right story for the person. It's hard stuff, and that's why some of the best reps are like they're naturally curious. They're the types of people that will show up at a wedding reception and just meet everybody, and ask a ton of questions about everything they're doing, because that's really a, one of the foundations of like great salesmanship. Um, is is the people who just get off on that, you know? You talked about that in your book, curiosity being being one of the biggest ones. And again, you know, talking about mutual admiration and, and validation. You know, not spending a lot of time together, but reading what you wrote and some of the ebooks I've created. I'm like, oh, look, we're, we're converging. Um, you call it creativity. Um, I call it uh, analysis and assessment skills, or the ability to want to understand. So I think they they pretty close. But to your point, when people go to a wedding, it's not just enough to to look at you and say, well, they want to understand you. Well. How, what's your connection to people here? And they, they don't feel comfortable if they don't understand how everything comes together, right? So whether it's curiosity. Oh, we lost you. He froze in a very interesting spot, but yeah. <laughs> we get him back? There we go. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry. Yeah, yeah exactly. Anyway. Exactly, Keen. You know, it's just, um, you know, it's it's funny that, these people who have that natural instinct around it, it's, it's, they're just, they're, they're, they're genuinely curious uh, around this and they can structure these sort of d double and triple click questions accordingly. You know, I, I go to, to, to weddings and I'll talk to someone and literally I can, I can meet someone for, you know, 20 minutes. They don't know anything about me other than my name. And every time they ask a question about me, I answer them quickly and then deflect it back to a question about themselves. And it's just yep. 20 questions, one after another. And I'm really listening because I'm not trying to do this to show off that I'm, like, I'm curious. And I just, I, I know, I know me. I want to know you. Yes. This is exciting yes. for me. Yes. And literally, they can walk away from this 20-minute conversation knowing nothing about me. And they'll go to their yes. wife like, that guy, Mark, really cool awesome. guy. Awesome guy. All I did was ask him questions about themselves, but I was so intrigued. And sometimes I asked a question that made him think about something differently. You know what I mean? It's like, holy cow. You know what? I've never thought about that. That's really interesting. They're learning just from the questions I'm asking. You know, and that's that when that comes natural to you, you you just you're gonna have a rock star career in sales. Yes. It's I, you know, it's funny I wrote a post a while back and Ruth, don't worry about trying to find it. But it was discovery questions versus provoking questions. Yeah, right. And when you start asking provoking questions, that changes the landscape. So, all right, let's let's trade this. So we know the salespeople can't ask questions. We know that they're there. Talk to me. Why does this happen? Why does leadership let this happen as a leader? Yeah. Well, I, I try not to. I mean, you know, I like I like your points around. I, I, I think you're right. Like a lot of leaders come in. And they sort of set the blueprint, set the script. It's like, okay, we got to control this animal house of, of salespeople, and so let's set the blueprint. 100 dials a day, 50 connects, you know, a month, 20, you know, 30 discovery calls, you know, 20 demos a month. And if we can do that and, and write a script around it, then it, it'll all work out. And I think that's part of your problem, as you suggested in the beginning, is when leaders try to control and almost quote unquote micromanage these processes, it makes it more difficult for the rep to get out of this 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 kind of script scripted zone and really personalize it to the customer's perspective. So I think, you know, the leadership they need to do a better job of not driving the sales process based on what you want your reps to do, but drive the buying journey. Right? Start when you're setting this stuff up as Look at the lens of your business and buying your product from the perspective of the buyer. How do they come to terms that they have a problem? How do they start the research process? How do they create their short list? How do they create a proof of concept? How do they influence the internal folks like finance or procurement or whoever needs to, to make a decision? Jot down your buying journey. Then ask yourself, how can my salespeople support that journey? 
And when you set this up, it doesn't mean scripting a demo. It means defining the guardrails so there's a common terminology and a sort of a blueprint on a map of how a salesperson should be helping this, the customer through the process. But it doesn't mean like you should say this and then you should show them this and then you know you have to draw the right guardrails but uh, leave them enough autonomy for them to add their secret sauce and personalize it to the customer. Do you think there's a chicken and egg going on here? It's they do this because they're bad people, or and they because they can't hire and they don't hire the right people. Because I really liked your the part of your book where you talked about how you identify the right people for the environment. I love the formula, um, which reminds we should have a side note conversation. I built something I wanted. I think cool. you'd like. And we could cool. maybe work with. But um, do you think it's that they just don't know what type of people to hire for? So they just hire anybody that's a salesperson and try to script how they should do it, or is it the other way around? They hire good people but then script them and, and kill good people. Oh, jeez. I see both. Um, I do think that there's pro big problems in both areas. I think a lot of uh, leaders uh, tend to try to hire people uh, from their domain. I think that's the biggest problem they do is like maybe it's just an easy box to check. It's like, have they sold to my buyer before? Have they sold software before? Have they sold marketing software before? And I think that's a big mistake. I think that by putting so much emphasis on that, it overshadows weaknesses in that candidate's uh, you know, background. I'll tell you that most of the salespeople here at HubSpot have not sold marketing software before. In fact, we have a lot of people who've never sold software before. We have some people who've never oh sold my God. before. You know what I mean? It's like, oh. and I see a lot of leaders, and I, especially when I coach like CEOs or new VPs of sales, that's their first criteria is, well, I'm just looking for someone who's sold to marketing people before. And, it's like you're, you're going to fall in a trap. And then, so that's a big part of it. And then the second one is, is just the way they set it up. So I, it's hard for me to say either way. I think there's big problems in both areas. So I, I have to. I, I'm probably going to cut this piece out because on our recruiting side of, of our business, Mark, yeah. I mean, cut it, I'm going to cut out and, and create its own separate thing. Yeah. One yeah. of the things we say in our recruiting side of the business is we, we don't find resumes. We find talent. And we tell our clients up front that if you're telling us we have to go find someone, and this one drives me crazy, they have to have SaaS experience, I'm going to throw up all over your lap. Because yeah, totally. to your point, finding someone who has SaaS experience and can sell SaaS hides weaknesses, but I'm going to flip the coin too. It avoids strengths. So someone could be a badass salesperson who could crush it for you, but your head is so wrapped around this uncorrelating experience checkbox that you, you, you've completely literally fucked your hiring process and getting people to understand that is the hardest part of our of the recruiting side of a business because that's our you know one of our differentiators and getting yeah. people to get it so thank you for that no of course and my, my line to them is always keep the mediocre and poor people selling for your competition mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like, God, mm -hmm. if, you, if you stole a, a bad sales rep from your competition, holy cow, that's a double win for them, right? <laughs> but if you can keep them there and grab the talent from outside your industry and bring them in, you're going to crush it. Oh, my God. I'm going to use that. we got to work on some sort of post or something. That is great stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's, that's how we built the whole company of sales guy recruiting and getting our customers to buy into that fully. Fully. They stay in the beginning, but then they, you know, they, they – React who doesn't have SaaS, I'm not sure, right? So good on you, good on you. So tell us, how do you guys do demos? How do you do the demos? What is unique about your team's demos? Yeah, I mean, we were the extreme version of this, um, of, of every, a great demo process that you're talking about because, you know, the, the hardest part of our sale is not them understanding the software. It's getting them to come to terms with the way that they're doing marketing is not working, and they need to do a different way of marketing. You know, you're talking to organizations out there that for decades have run advertising campaigns, have cold called, have gone to trade shows, have done all these techniques, and they're like, yeah, our revenue's down. Like, I wonder why. When was the last time you picked up a cold call? When was the last time you clicked on an advertisement or gone to a trade show? It's all vendors, right? So, so we have to basically transform the way they think around their marketing strategy and help them understand that today it's all about driving, you know, building content or writing blogs and, and e-books and, and winning the Google game and winning the social media game and getting people to find you. So we were the extreme version of this. And so we created, just to get really personal on, on our stuff, was we, um, we created our own uh, acronym called GPCT. It was the easiest thing I could come up with that sort of summarizes it. It's goals, plan, challenges, timeline. So this is a, a mini checklist that... 
the salesperson can use. It's really simple. You never forget it. And in your discovery, it doesn't have to go in that order, but you're just kind of making notes how I'm doing here. So what are their business goals? What is their plan to achieve those business goals? How, what are my challenges that I see in, in executing that plan, and what's my timeline to achieve the goal? And of course, there's, there's double-click questions and all of that, and so that, that's how we handled it was we would just hammer our salespeople and train and then hammer them in the, after the discovery call, where, we, where are we on GPCT? Run through the GPCT with me. And then we, you could start to categorize the different GPCTs you'd find, and you'd let that drive the demo. Right, so as an example, like you know, our our product has gotten very broad over the, the, what it was seven years ago. I mean, seven years ago it was like a blog and an SEO tool. Today it's an <laughs> entire marketing platform, right? So you can have you can have a customer who has like doesn't even have a website, and and is like, I want to start blogging and getting traffic. I have no traffic today. I want to start driving traffic. They're a great fit for us. And then you can have a customer who has a million visitors a month. And, and all they're trying to do is increase the percentage of people that are becoming a lead and warming those leads up a little bit better for their sales team. That's a beautiful customer for us. Now imagine the demos for those two customers. Entirely different. Find a demo that I could tell to both of them and win the deal. You know what I mean? Oh, that's, so, that's right so there. Just, that's beautiful. You know, yeah. Exactly. Right. So that's, that's the key is you know, the, the driving it. GPCT has been our, our way and a foundation for our methodology. It's been great for our discovery call. And then you can start to categorize these different GPCT outcomes into suggested demo flows for the reps. So what you do then is you start, as, a, as an organization, structurally, you start to see common GPCT yes. um, outcomes. And you can say, OK, you still can't nail it, but you can, you can bridge the gap between this little one and this one and say, OK, if it looks like this, then these are the types of features and functions and, and solutions we want to drive here in the demo. If it looks like this one, then we want to look. And you can create three, four, seven, eight, or whatever, and at least give them a box to play in. Exactly. You, we call these micro personas. You know, personas is a great term these days that people have been driving things around. So these become almost micro personas of like, they're kind of the same role and the same person, but they might be at different sophistication levels in their marketing maturity. And then we can help the reps kind of see that as they advance in their own skill sets and sort of map that customized demo to their to that GPCT. I freaking love it. So sales leaders, hashtag sales leaders. Did you hear that? This was a takeaway. How do you create one demo to do all of that? How? So it comes back to the structure, which I love, the structure you create to allow your salespeople to have some freedom, and it comes back to hiring. So what do you think? You, you want to share this a little bit? How do you hire for people to do a good demo? Yeah, so you know, I, I brought it out to hire to hire people to, to succeed, right? And, and that was one of the main conclusions I saw in, in the early years of, of HubSpot was, you know, I, was, I had the good fortune, like I think it was my, the first year, maybe my seventh or eighth hire, I actually snagged the top rep out of a public company here in Boston. The person ranked out of like 800 reps, they were number one. And I was convinced they would come, come in and kind of redefine re, re, um, the game for us. And it turns out they didn't. They didn't. I mean, they didn't do poorly, but they didn't crush it either. And I realized like, that the place they were coming from, it was a, it was a two-minute demo. I mean, everyone in the world knew their brand. They knew the elevator pitch. It was just you either had this problem or you didn't. I mean, that couldn't have been more different than the sales context we had in 2008 where no one had, knew HubSpot, no one knew inbound marketing, no one knew what – half the people didn't even know what a blog was. I mean, there was just – you could imagine that the reps that would succeed in both those environments were very different. So my big kind of takeaway is so much of your ideal hiring has to do with your context. But what I did do was I was very disciplined around defining the 10 criteria that I thought would co correlate in our environment. And what does each one mean? What's a score of a 1, a 3, a 5, a 7, a 10 mean? And scoring every candidate and every hire against that criteria. And, you know, four hires in, it's interesting to go back after those folks either do well or not and reflect what am I seeing as commonality? And if you're, if you're really trying to go hard and like we were and hiring a couple reps a month, and before you know it, you've got a couple dozen reps under you, like you can start doing regression analyses. You know, go oh, call no your buddy way. at MIT. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Don't, you don't have to go. I don't want to scare you away. But like this is how crazy we went with it. Uh, and, and it was really comforting as we scaled up to a large organization that we had the stats behind us to back us up on our answer. So anyway, there were five criteria for us 
you know, which I do think correlate in SaaS and software and startups that that did well. The the number one was coachability. Uh, number say two that again. is cu- yeah. Say that. Say number one again. Coachability. Say it one more time. One. Coachability. I mean, one number more time. one. Number one is coachability of your app. Everybody listening, please. Everybody listening, because <laughs> I know it doesn't show up on anybody's job description doesn't. when we're hiring the people. But keep going, yep. And I talk more about that. It wasn't even my initial theory of the coachability, but after many iterations, that one came out, and it's beautiful. Coachability, curiosity, uh, work ethic, intelligence, and prior success. Those are the five that, that uh, correlate in our environment, and I do think they correlate Wait. in a lot of tech ones. Where's marketing experience? Where's SaaS experience? No, okay. Where's ex- the years of experience? Where's the school they went to? Where's knowledge of your industry? Where's all that shit? Negatively correlated in many cases. If you want to talk about the stats. Hmm. Interesting. All right. See? I, that's what I love about this. And I love the fact that you were not an original sales guy and you took both an artistic but also a, a scientific approach to this and you're able to measure things that other people say that can't be measured. Read his book, by the way, guys, because it talks about how he determined things like coachability. It was awesome. It made me realize I have moved a little bit away from that. I used to do some of the things, not exactly, but and I was like, oh my god, I stopped doing that. Why? So I need to go back to that. So there's some great stuff in this book, you guys. Um, all right, so Mark, parting advice on doing a killer demo, one for leaders and one for individual contributors. Yeah, so on the leadership side, make sure you set broad guardrails, but give these salespeople enough autonomy to not only personalize the demo to the buyer, but also add their own secret sauce as a salesperson. You know, as I look across our top salespeople, lots of times the top ones are world class at one or two things and kind of okay at everything else. Like whether they're a great rapport builder, bring a lot of energy to the business, maybe even just they, they almost sound like a geek techie, but they win because they sound so smart. So give your reps enough autonomy to add that secret sauce and personalize the experience to the customers. And then as a rep, take advantage of that. Don't show up and want to punch the clock. you got to think. And, and this is the fun thing about sales. Sales becomes mundane when you're reading the script, doing the elevator pitch, and clicking the same five feature demo all day. That sucks. But sales is fun when you're talking to all these people and getting to know them getting to know their business, getting to know the way they think about their business, and signing yourself up as a coach and consultant to them. right? So try to take that leap and apply it to your demo. Love it, love it, love it. And uh, I'm going to add to that the takeaway that I leave with salespeople is, as I said before, can you do a demo without ever saying if, if you have this problem, if you do it this way, if. And I promise you, most of you do it. If you can learn to say it without saying if, you're on the right track. Love it. Awesome. All right, hey, Ruth, do we have questions? So it's question time. You want to take some questions, Mark? Sure. Looking for questions, and I can't find any, guys. I think we've just done too good a job. Um, but it is time for Cut It Out. Cut It Out. Do you know what Cut It Out is, Mark? I don't. Cut it out as every show we take a piece of something that salespeople do or sales organizations do, they got to stop. <laughs> so this week's cut it out is, is chasing the customer to make your quota. Pushing your customer. So it's Q, so cut it out. It's Q2, you're behind quota by 3%. You send a note to all the salespeople say, can you pull this in? Can you pull that in? Can you get this deal in? What can it take to get the customer to close now? i.e. how do we get the customer to get outside of their buying cycle to beat our revenue cycle? Sales managers, sales leaders, VPs, CEOs, CEOs, cut it out. Cut it out. Stop it. It's not about you. It is about the buyer. It's about the prospect. And they could give a shit if you make quota or not. So why are you giving away the farm? Why are you pushing them into a situation that shows and demonstrates you don't really care about them. You only care about you. Again, cut it out. You're, if you're doing that, that means you, CEO, COO, and EVP of sales, haven't done your job because it tells me that your pipeline is not big enough. It tells me that you didn't recognize this ahead of time. It tells me that your team is not doing a good job of moving things from stage to stage. It tells me you're good, not good at forecasting. 
The reason you're coming up short on your number is because you're unaligned and disconnected, and now you're blaming the customer and putting it on the customer to solve your problem. Here's this week's cut it out. Cut it out. Stop pushing the customer to make your number. Mark, you want to try? You ever do that, Mark? Oh uh, gosh, I love no, I love that, Keenan. Yes, of course. I mean, but I, I wholeheartedly agree with it. I mean, as as heads of sales, we've all been there before. You're gonna fall behind in a quarter, but I agree with you. I hate it when you have to go there. And I'd say I'd add two things to your to your advice: is when that does happen, find a way to accelerate some buying journeys in a way that benefits the customer. This could be by grabbing your executive team and offering some free consultations. I mean, when you know they they love to spend time with their CEO. They love to spend time with their head of marketing if they're marketers. Maybe their head of engineering if, you're, if they're engineering. Try to add value it as a way to trigger and accelerate the, the journey. And then spend half the time fixing the problem for the long term. Right? So don't just pull all the deals from the next quarter. You're going to be doing the same thing the next quarter. The find, a way to drive, find a way to drive that activity. Find a way to drive that pipeline. Yes. Even though it's not going to help you this quarter, you know, for the most part, that, that ship has sailed but fix the problem for next quarter. Yes, because what happens is they get on the hamster wheel. I've seen it so often. You pull that deal from Q2 into Q1, then you're pulling from Q3 to Q2, and now you're on the hamster wheel. And it's spinning and spinning, and you never get off. You never totally. get off. So nice totally. work. Nice work. Thanks, baby. I All right, so... Shout out, shout out to uh, Jake Rennie. He won our gear. Now his gear and a book. Right. Rennie just took it, took care of business. He was not messing around. He was clean, yes, sweet. He's from Higher. Wow. We use Higher. Oh, we love Higher View. Yeah. Yes, we love Higher View. So shout out to Higher View for hiring people that know how to get it done. What do we call this? The triple, triple crown in baseball. He got all three. So well done, Rennie. Love it. Um, so thank you very much, Mark, for coming on. I really enjoyed it. It was a blast. You dropped some good advice. I enjoyed your enthusiasm. And you, you represented HubSpot and MIT with some good thoughts. <laughs> Thanks, Keenan. Love, love being here. I love being here, Ruth. Thanks, guys, for having me on. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. And so the next next episode, episode four, is going to be with Coca Sex, and we're doing social selling. We may also have an additional special guest, so stay with us. You don't want to miss that. So with that said, thanks, my boy, Mark. Thanks, for y'all, for showing up. Don't screw up the demo anymore. You've been given the word. Until next time, I'm out. Peace.